Let's see an example of what collaboration between the Pentagon and filmmakers looks like. Ridley Scott's Black Hawk Down was produced by Jerry Bruckheimer and released in 2001. The film is based on the Battle of Mogadishu in October 1993. The bloody US foray ended in humiliation for the Rangers and Delta forces. Pictures of the bodies of dead US soldiers being dragged through the streets of Mogadishu shocked America and brought an immediate withdrawal of US troops from Somalia. Never again, said Americans. Never again, said the Clinton administration. The Mogadishu effect was born. And yet, the military had no objections about supporting Ridley Scott's film. That our senior leadership and certainly the people in the Special Operations Command saw this as an opportunity not to critique a poorly understood operation to begin with, but rather just to show the incredible uh, endurance, bravery, uh, selfless uh, atmosphere or collective personnel that these soldiers demonstrated. That was, that was really what it was all about. The Pentagon had reacted favorably to the book it was based on, Black Hawk Down by Mark Bowden. While the journalist makes no secret of the US defeat, his dramatic portrayal of the firefight paints the military in a heroic fashion. And while the book actually provides wider context to what led to this firefight and also portrays the views of Somalis involved, the film does not do any of this. As Mark Bowden stated, the decision that director Ridley Scott made was primarily that the story of Black Hawk Down is the story of a group of American soldiers who go through this ordeal. And he focused his telling of the story through the eyes of those soldiers. The film, shot in Morocco, told the story of the battle itself and nothing more. It gives no political background. The Somali point of view isn't considered. What's more, Ridley Scott made numerous changes to please the Pentagon. One of the requests made by the army was to cut two scenes out of the original script. One scene that depicted tensions between different US military units. Another scene that showed US forces accidentally coming under fire from fellow American forces. It was an unfortunate event that happened in the battle. It was deleted from the movie. Army censorship, self-censorship from the director. Ridley Scott only said that he cut the scenes for artistic reasons. According to Scott, the Pentagon went out of its way to help the film get shot and released at all costs. The Pentagon provided eight helicopters and 135 soldiers. This was like taking a little army company into Morocco, at a time when the US did not even have a status of forces agreement with Morocco. So, the Pentagon worked with the government of Morocco in order to allow US forces to come in. This is a good example of the type of support filmmakers receive if they agree to the Pentagon's corrections. But what if filmmakers do not agree to the suggestions made by the Pentagon? Well, first and foremost, it means that they have to make the film without the military. This was the case with Forrest Gump, which depicted a character too dim-witted and a plot too critical for the army's taste. The thin red line was also turned down. Generals don't look kindly on soldiers who have doubts. Oliver Stone's platoon, released in 1986, didn't win the army's support either. While the movie didn't criticize the Vietnam War, military officials didn't like the portrayals of distraught GIs, backed by doubts, committing atrocious acts against Vietnamese civilians. Well, because the, the imp impression that you get is that every combat patrol invo involved, you know, rapes and torching, you know, structures. It was like 
and, and fragging your senior officers and battles between NCOs. I mean, I don't think anyone in the Army was saying that none of that ever happened anywhere, but I think, this, I think that what I heard was the notion that that was the entire Vietnam War. You know, every day was another day of platoon. Without Army support, it took Oliver Stone 10 years to come up with the money to make his film. He had to go all the way to the Philippines to get the equipment he needed. But of course, with Platoon winning an Oscar, this became a bit of a problem for the Pentagon. So it had to change its strategy somehow. Since Platoon, the military has gone one step further. It is now willing to turn a blind eye when the truth is twisted in order to keep its hand in the movie. Only one thing really matters. The military's image cannot be tarnished. The Jack TV series about military judges is a good example. Popular for over eight years, it has inconsistencies. But what those vetting the scripts now do is to allow for a 90% rule. As long as it doesn't threaten the untarnished image, as long as it doesn't threaten recruitment and retention goals, they're happy to overlook those 10% that twist the plot. If you had 100% accuracy, it might not be as exciting. And having a hand in the plot oftentimes contributes to the excitement and makes the military look good. For the Pentagon, it makes for good entertainment and is a boon for recruiting. Another way in which the Pentagon seeks to influence the portrayal of the military has been to work exclusively with directors and producers who it knows it can trust. You know you develop a rapport and you stand on your work. And when you come in the door and you say, I did Black Hawk Down, I did Pearl Harbor or Top Gun, then they say, oh, we like those movies or we didn't like those movies. But in most cases with the military, they like what we have done and how we portray them. And that's how we get access and that's how we get the military hardware. That type of cooperation is now stretching beyond the making of movies. Jerry Bruckheimer and Bertram von Münster sold to the Pentagon the idea of Profiles from the Front Line, a reality TV show that followed U.S. troops on patrol in Afghanistan. Victoria Clark, who was the PR manager under Rumsfeld, devised an experiment uh, in 2001 where they allowed some uh, TV producers to tag along with soldiers during the Afghani invasion. And this was later turned into a reality TV show, much like Cops, called Profiles from the Front Line. And it was shown in uh, January and February of 2003 in the buildup to the Iraq War. And it was so successful that uh, Rumsfeld and Dick Cheney decided that they would use it as a model by which the embedded reporting system was designed. It feels more like a commercial than it does like a documentary. The series films real soldiers, not actors. The crews are really out in the battlefield and the style is shot as if it is a documentary. But Profiles presents a sanitized version of the war. No one dies. There's much to do about merits of the special forces, America's new heroes. The problem is, as soon as the fighting gets close, the camera gets turned off. Whether it's blockbuster movies or reality TV shows, the collaboration between the Pentagon and Hollywood has been long-standing and close because both sides benefit. For the military, the benefits lie in recruitment and influencing the positive portrayal of the armed forces. For Hollywood, collaborating with the military gives them access to billions of dollars worth of military kit. And this allows them to make war look more authentic and spectacular, which in turn enables filmmakers to reach bigger audiences and generate more revenue. It is indeed what Phil Strupp called a relationship of mutual exploitation.